All right. This time we'll uh, welcome our Facebook friends and our Q call people that join us on Q call. We're so thankful. Sometimes we think, you know, there's not many people here, but if we add all you guys in there, this place is packed out. So we're just excited about that, to believe that, to, to trust in that, to be able to see that, uh, that we are not small in number. We are united together uh, in praise and worship of the God who, uh, who comes through. He comes through in our darkest hours. Uh, he brings the light into those situations. He brings joy where there's mourning and uh, can fulfill our hearts even when they're heavy. And this song talks about it. All of my days, yes, I will uh, bring, bring joy to the Lord because he gives us the joy and then we return it to him. Joy and praise and thanksgiving. Uh, it's just amazing when we catch a glimpse of him and then we can return all of that to him. Everything good in this world comes from him. So we're glad to be able to give that back today. So let's stand and sing. Yes, I will. Yes, we will. All right, I'm going to read Psalms 95. 
Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, for the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountains' peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Oh, man, to see ourselves as a flock under his care, to see us, to see him as the great shepherd who cares for us and fights off uh, the lies of the devil and the and the things of this earth that might uh, sway us away from him or out of the flock. Help. You know, we just thank him for being there and for revealing him himself to us so that we can believe in him. So let's sing this song. This I believe.
believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Worthy is 
Like this next song says, I stand in awe, but, okay, John, when he saw Jesus in Revelations, falls down as if he's dead. I don't know. I don't think we're going to be able to stand in his presence, at least not the first time that we come before him, that we meet him face to face. So, you know, his, uh, that last song is talking about his holiness and his, my goodness, his power and his worthiness. It's just, it's over the top, unbelievable what it's going to be like to see him in his glory. So, yes, we stand in awe, but I think we're going to fall down. thankful that you are beautiful beyond description 
So reveal to us today, help us to see, help us to get a glimpse of your glory, a glimpse of how beautiful you are. So much so that we fall down before you. We can't help but to fall down, to to kneel in your presence, to proclaim you as God, to proclaim you as Lord of our lives. We see you as the king, the king of all kings, the great and coming king. Help us to submit to you, to fall down before you today. Amen. Good morning. It's a privilege to worship with you, and I pray that you are experiencing the presence of God like we were during that worship set. It's it's amazing and really unthinkable that a holy God who has that much power would even want to come and meet with us, and yet he does. If we'll come and present ourselves and just ask, he'll come and overwhelm us, and we continue to ask that he does that as we hear from his word, as, as we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount called the Upside Down Kingdom, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would bring your word alive, that you would make it live for us, make us live because of it and change the world through us. We're six weeks into this series and we are still not even through the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's called the Beatitudes, and this is where Jesus lays out what it looks like to be blessed in God's kingdom, and it's radically different. It's upside down from the world's idea of what blessing is. Everything that follows in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount has its foundation right here in these Beatitudes. Remember, the Bible is one book telling one story, of God and mankind. And even the things in the Bible that seem to be standalone statements, unrelated to anything else, really cannot be fully understood without looking at what was happening or being said before and after those things. And when we look at the context, the circumstances around it, we see the Beatitudes is not some random list of various people who will be blessed in various ways but a precise picture of what it looks like to be in relationship with God. The Beatitudes, when we do this, when we, when we take the context, it goes from an unrelated, somewhat confusing thing that Jesus said before the sermon really got started. Um, clearly, Jesus didn't read the preaching manuals because The preaching manuals will say, you need to spend several minutes up front connecting with people. Tell them how your week was and tell them, listen, your time is way too valuable. If you want to know how my week was, let's go have lunch. We'll talk outside. While we're here, the word of God is what's important. And what Jesus was saying before the Sermon on the Mount was part of the Sermon on the Mount. It was not throwaway. It was every bit as important. As a matter of fact, if we don't get this understood We're going to struggle with the rest. It's the building blocks of everything else that the Sermon on the Mount is made of. It's the key to actually living out these crazy things that Jesus says we're to live. And this morning, we're on the sixth beatitude, which is recorded in Matthew 5.8. Matthew 5.8 says this, Blessed are the the pure in heart, for they will see God. At first glance, we want to read this and go, If you're pure in heart, you're going to go to heaven where you will see God. 
which immediately is putting our spin on it because that's not really what Jesus said. Now, there is truth there for sure because in heaven we will see God, we'll we'll be in his presence and be able to actually look on his glory and not die. His holiness, his purity, his majesty is so overwhelming that in our human, tainted, imperfect form, it would kill us. We could not do that. And uh, earlier, Richie alluded to, to John when he was given the revelation, and he fell as dead before the glory of the Lord. But when we get there, we will get to see him, and we will be given glorified bodies that are able to withstand that amazing holiness. But if we read this with only that understanding, what we get is another item on the to-do list, right? Right? where we're told what is required, we go and do it in order to get what we want. I want to go to heaven, so I better be pure in heart, right? But that's not an agreement with the context of the Beatitudes. It's not an agreement with the context of the Sermon on the Mount or the Bible itself. No human being has ever, ever, ever been able to be enough, to to, to do in our own strength, to find a way to be worthy to enter God's presence. We're not going to do it, right? That's the whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth and living as one of us, but doing it perfectly and then dying on the cross as if he had not done it perfectly, taking the, the penalty of sin, and because of that, And because he rose from the dead and now lives forever, he is now able to cover over our impurity with his purity, cleansing us from our unrighteousness before God and before mankind. Because our righteousness is not only between us and God, it's our relationships between other people as well. And so Jesus now can bring us into a right relationship with the Father. It's the only way it could happen because we'll never be able to do it on our own. In the Garden of Eden, there was one command, don't eat that. Couldn't do it. Then there were the Ten Commandments, do this, don't do that. Couldn't do it. What makes us think that finally we're going to get a command that we can actually do? So to think that Jesus is telling us, if you want to get to heaven, you better get your act together, get your heart pure, and then we'll see you. It's totally missing the mark. So we're going to break this into two parts. We're going to dig into each one in order to try to get the full understanding of what Jesus is telling us here. Part one, pure in heart. What does it actually mean to be pure in heart, and how does it happen? And then part two, what's he really meaning when he says, see God? So let's first understand the term pure in heart. The Greek word translated pure is katharos. It's where we get catharsis, a a cleaning, a purging of our emotions and our mental, that was so cathartic. I feel so much better. That's where the root of that comes from. And its definition in Greek is clean. It's used to describe things that are clean, pure, unstained, either literally or spiritually. It's used both of those ways. It's used to describe the guiltless, the innocent, and the upright. So in the physical sense, something that is pure is unmixed with anything else. It has had everything removed so that what is left is only one thing, the real deal. Right? We we run our water through filters to filter out the stuff that might make us sick. Oil is refined. It's purified to make it cleaner burning and easier to use in different settings. Gold. Gold is refined by heating it up to its boiling point till it becomes metal or till it becomes liquid and then scooping off the impurities as they float to the surface. Now, gold is very precious, but it's found in the ground and it's mixed with rock and other metals and junk that is not valuable. A gold nugget isn't really good for much until the junk has been removed, separated out. But when that gold has been made pure, it's very valuable. It's very useful for a lot of things, right? A pure heart is very valuable and very useful for the kingdom of God. 
And when it comes to having a pure heart, Jesus isn't really talking about the muscle that's pumping our blood, but who we really are inside. The word heart is often used in the Bible to talk about people's thoughts and desires, motivations, what makes us who we are, right? In Proverbs 4.23, we read this, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Right? And then in Matthew 15, 18 through 20, Jesus says, The things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them or make them unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, these are what defile a person. So someone who is pure in heart has been spiritually cleansed. Who they are on the inside has been cleansed from imperfections, from sin, so that our innermost thoughts, our desires, our motivations are now in alignment with God and what he wants, right? The, any junk in our heart that is not perfect love, because that's who God is, love for God and love for those around us, anything that is not that gets purged, it gets removed, it gets filtered out, leaving behind the pure heart. So in big churchy words, it's called sanctification, right? Being sanctified means being set apart, being made holy and pure and dedicated to God. So we don't really need to know that in order to experience its effects, but I'm going to build on it a little bit later, so I wanted to throw that out so that we could be thinking about it. First, though, let's think about being made pure for a minute. How does it actually happen? Or maybe a better question is, who's responsible for things getting purified? In the case of the oil, it's the workers in the oil refinery They put it through a process. They do whatever they do. In the case of gold, it's the goldsmith, the person working with the gold. Even with water, the filter does the purifying. The water is just forced through it. Even pure mountain spring water is only that because the water has trickled down through the ground and that trickling process has trapped the impurities and what is left is a pure water. Nothing is capable of purifying itself unless it is acted on by an outside agent. And this is for sure why we can know Jesus is not saying, go get your act together, go get your heart pure, and we'll see you in heaven later. It's not possible. He doesn't tell us to do anything that we can't do. Right? We're contaminated with sin. It's mixed into us at the spiritual level because of the original sin of Adam and Eve in that garden. And it's passed down through mankind, through the seed of man to the children every single time without exception. There is only one sinless human that ever walked the earth, and that's Jesus, and that's only because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit's seed in the human body of Mary, and so he was fully God and fully human, and the seed of man which carries the sin was left out of the equation. You and I, not so fortunate. This is how powerful and deadly sin really is. We can't get it out of us. And that's why our only hope is through Jesus, right? Jesus didn't sin, and he will credit his righteousness, his sinlessness, his purity to our account if we'll let him. We let him by crying out to him, confessing our need, realizing and then proclaiming, I can't do it. I can never get right enough. Would you help me? Would you save me? Would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? And He's waiting on that, and he doesn't hesitate. He wants to answer those prayers. So after we pray that prayer, we're never going to sin again, right? You're awful quiet. (laughs) Me too. Yeah, we're going to sin again. But what happens if we do? 
So this is where we come back to that word sanctification that I threw out there earlier, uh, because there's another big churchy term, progressive sanctification, that is helpful for us to understand. So when we cry out to Jesus to save us, we are declared pure and holy and righteous in God's sight on paper. Boom, done, deal. You pray, you sincerely from your heart ask to be forgiven, ask to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And in God's sight on his book, you're sinless. Still blows my mind. When he looks at us, he doesn't see our sin anymore, but Jesus' perfection, Jesus' sinlessness is covered over. That's instant, immediate, but it's in the spiritual realm. It's between us and God. We still live in the physical world where we have to deal with each other. So then Jesus begins the process of progressive sanctification or ongoing purification, right? It makes our actual physical lives line up more and more and more with the holiness of God, with what God sees on paper. Now, there'll be some who would tell you that once you've prayed that prayer, you can't sin again. No matter what you do, it's not sin. I can't find any support for that in the Bible. I cannot find anything that says salvation is only a spiritual concept unrelated to our physical life. But there are many who who preach and teach that. It's called heresy. It's called untrue doctrine. And it's deadly. We still walk in this broken, broken world and we will still think, say, and do things that don't line up perfectly with God's perfect love. First of all, those things are supposed to be the exception not the rule. Second, we're never to defend them. We're never to say, well, I wouldn't have, but you made me. Blame shift. We wouldn't have said, well, normally I'm okay, but in this situation, they, they just really deserve it. There's no justification for sin ever. There's only being made right between us and, between, between us and God and between us and our neighbor. Those, those times when we don't hit a home run out of the park will become fewer and fewer and fewer if we let them. Because the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus implants in us when we are saved, when we pray, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. And his work is to purify us, to take us more and more from who we used to be and make us more and more like the perfection of Jesus. Let's go back to that gold nugget for a minute. We'll get a better idea maybe of how this really plays out. When a goldsmith buys a gold nugget, he buys it with all the junk in it, right? He pays the price. It's his. Nobody's going to take that gold nugget away. But he has no intention of leaving it that way. He can't do anything with it if it's still got all the junk in it, right? He wants to make something beautiful out of that gold nugget. He sees that gold not as it currently is with all of the nastiness in it, but as he knows it will be because he knows the process he's about to put it through. So once that nugget is in his hands, he begins the refining process. They He heats it up until it becomes liquid. The impurities float to the top. He scoops them away, leaving the gold more pure than it was, right? And he repeats this process over and over and over until he has pure gold that he can make into something beautiful. It's been said that the the way the ancient goldsmiths would know that the gold was really pure is when, when it cooled down, they could see their reflection in it perfectly which is really a good way to think about what God intends for us, right? Because when he works with us and he removes the impurities, we look less like we used to and more like him. He wants his reflection to shine forth from us to the world. And what's his reflection look like? Perfect love. Not a bunch of rules. Not a bunch of judgment. Not anger. Not I told you so. 
perfect love, perfect love that gives itself so that someone else can live, perfect love that pays the price so that it never deserved to pay so that someone else doesn't have to suffer the consequences that they do deserve. It's perfect love. And God intends us to reflect his perfect love to the world. Now, unfortunately, the process that God uses to do that in our lives is very much like the process the goldsmith uses to purify gold. He turns up the heat. We encounter all kinds of uncomfortable situations. We had a discussion in in our Sunday school class this morning. Um, And one of the things that came out was we often think that our personal comfort is the baseline for where we need to be with God. And like, if God, if we're in line with God, everything's going to be right, and everything is going to be good, and our personal comfort is, if it's not, if we're not experiencing that, then God's mad at us and whatever. And that's simply not true. Our personal comfort matters way less than our eternal salvation. And if our personal comfort now is going to get in the way of us spending eternity with the God who loves us and who gave himself for us on the cross, he's going to make us uncomfortable. He will do that, and it's his mercy that does that. And he will turn up the heat in order that the imperfections in our lives can come out, right? We encounter all kinds of things. Being wronged by someone else. Being taken advantage of, having a tragedy that rips from us something that we dearly love, being presented with all kinds of temptations and desires. These are all things that will reveal the impurities in our hearts. And at that point, when God reveals them, we have a choice. We have a choice to say, okay, there they are. It's ugly, but you can have it. Or we can try to cover it over and say, no, it's not really there. You didn't see what you saw. There's nothing here. Move along. Right? If we keep the impurities, though, what happens is the next time we have a situation that brought it out of us, the ugly, the ugly is going to still be in there and it's going to come out again. We're going to respond to the same situations the same way we always have. And that's not healthy. It's not good for us spiritually, it's not good for the people around us, and it's definitely not good for God's good name. I mean, we probably all know people who have said, if that's how Christians are, I don't want any part of that church. God help us. His reflection is supposed to be what people see, and his reflection is perfect love. So if we hang on to those impurities... We're going to keep getting angry at situations. We're going to hold on to grudges and remain bitter when people have done us wrong. We're going to be greedy and hoard things. We're going to lust. Even if we never physically act on it, it's the same thing as if we had. Whatever. We don't reflect the nature and character of God in a situation. And if we're not reflecting the nature and character of God, we're reflecting the nature and character of Satan. If we will allow God to remove the impurities, though, that these situations have brought to the surface, then the image of God will get reflected in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And when we, when we don't hit it out of the park, our first response should not be to run from God and try to hide, but to run to him and say, Daddy, I messed up. Will you help me? And he will, he'll scoop us up and he will dust us off and he'll say, I know that you are unhappy with your ability to respond. Let me, let me remove that. Let me help you. Let me purify your heart a little bit more. And the next time it happens, see, here's the other thing. We think that we get through that one, it'll never happen again. That's not true. What happens is, is that we become stronger as we, beget, we get more purified and those things are going to happen. Jesus says offenses will happen. They'll never stop. But we gain the ability, the freedom to respond differently than we ever could have. And so we don't get angry. We don't bring vengeance. We don't 
let our eyes wander or our minds wander. We are made pure, becoming more and more and more like the perfection of God and living more and more into the purposes that he created for us. Remember, the nugget of gold can't be worked with until the junk is out of it. And once it's gone, man, whew, beautiful things. Does that mean until you're perfect, you have to sit on the bench and can't do anything for the Lord? Absolutely not. None of us are going to be perfect. And if that was the, the standard, I certainly wouldn't be here. But God works with broken things and is still able to bring beautiful things to fruition. But the process that we're in is progressively becoming more and more pure. But it's really important that we understand it's God's work in us. It's not go try harder. Oh, you messed up. Don't do that again. You better be different next time. Well, I can't be different because that's what's in me. Oh, if you just let it out once, it'll be fine. Just rage and it'll, it'll go away. How's that ever worked? You let out rage, it multiplies. But if you give it to God, he will remove it. Pure in heart does not mean clean on the inside, but dirty on the outside either. That's something else. You know, and that's earlier we talked about that. People will say, you pray that prayer, you're, you're pure in heart, you, you can't sin anymore, so just go live your life and everything will work out okay. That's really not what it means. Something else that we often say is, well, the Lord knows my heart and you can't judge me. We usually say that when we've been called to account for something we've said or done that isn't in line with what God says. Remember, God says that our heart and our thoughts and our actions are all the same thing, right? Jeremiah 17.10 says this, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Now, this isn't excusing bad behavior because of a good heart, but it's warning people who put on a front that you can't live like that because he sees through it and he knows really what's there. Do you know that it's possible to do the right thing for the wrong reasons? It's possible to look great on the outside but be a mess on the inside. It's not simply about doing the right thing. It's about being in right relationship with God, with ourselves, and with others. Romans 2.5 says this, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Unrepentance simply means not asking God to take that nastiness out of us, not owning our sin and then handing it off to Jesus to do away with it. What's in our heart matters. So let's look for a second at the second half of our starting scripture. Seeing God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So those who accept the offer of salvation that Jesus gives and allow him to continue to purify them throughout their lives without forsaking him, turning their back on him, cutting off the process and saying, I don't want any more of that, those people will absolutely see God in heaven. We've established that. But the Greek word here that is used has a deeper meaning. It's horeo, and it is to see, to perceive, to attend to, to experience, to perceive, or to discern. So discern is more than simply seeing. It's being able to pick it out of its surroundings. This word is often used in a metaphorical sense, with, which is seeing with the mind or being spiritually awakened. We often say, oh, I see what you did there. When somebody says something witty, right? They, they, they connect two things that are really unrelated. And when we get it, when it clicks, we get the joke or we get the point that they're trying to make. Ah, I see what you did there, right? We see the connection. We appreciate the message. And when we allow ourselves to be purified by God from the inside out, when we allow him to work in us and through us, we begin to see God everywhere. 
we see what he's doing. No longer is a random event random, right? But we understand that it's part of what God's doing in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Where before we would have just lived our lives compartmentalized and, you know, met with God on a Sunday or or whenever, now we see that everything, everywhere is connected with God. No longer do we see blessings as something to consume and use up for our comfort, but rather tools for building the kingdom of God and blessing those around us, trusting that he will bring more if we need more, and trusting if we don't get more, we didn't need it. No longer do we see the wrong thing done to us as something that they must pay for but rather as opportunities for the mercy and grace and love that's been poured out on us to be poured out through us. There can be no forgiveness without an offense. We are people of forgiveness, and it's a two-way thing, right? We're not just people who have been forgiven. We are people who forgive. And if we're not, we are not people of God. When our hearts are being purified, our thoughts, our words, our actions, our deepest motivations are brought in line with God's. And we see him everywhere. And this is simply not possible without the work of the Holy Spirit in us, purifying our hearts, opening our eyes, and making it visible to us. And again, it's he who does this purifying work. We don't get there by trying harder, but we can refuse the process. We can put a stop to it. And if God doesn't do that in our hearts, we're unable to see or think or understand anything correctly. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God, right? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, to those who have not been in the presence of the Lord and had their eyes opened. But once you've come into relationship with him, he opens your eyes and you see it, and it becomes the most beautiful thing ever, a torture device, the most cruel thing ever devised becomes something that we hold up and we say how beautiful that is. Upside down down. But it's because we see what God was doing there. You can look at that and see what man was doing there, and it's ugly. It's horrendous. It should be cut down and burned. But when we look at it and see what God was doing there, we put it on a wall, and we pray in front of it, and we sing songs to God in front of it, right? It's possible for people to see the same thing but have a different understanding. And it doesn't mean that we all just get to live our own truth because it's what I think, it's what I understand. No. Missing what God's doing, it keeps us from living in the benefits of the real truth. Impure hearts keep us from seeing the beauty of the cross. We'll never understand God by filtering him through our brains or our logic. A God we can understand is not a God at all. It's just one of us. Or really what it is, it's us masquerading our thoughts and feelings as God. The only way we can truly ever understand anything about the nature and character of God or what he's doing in the world is by first coming to him and admitting that we need his help with everything. Everything. If simply understanding him is the goal, we're still in the driver's seat, and we're going to miss it. The purpose of knowing God isn't so that we'll understand more. It's so that we can be united with him, so that we can experience him forever. Without God's help, we don't even understand ourselves and why we do the things we do sometimes. You ever done something and go like, why? Why did I knew better. Why would I do that? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond a cure. Who can understand it? God can understand it. And he sees you. And he knows your struggle. And he loves you. And he's made a way 
so that you don't have to live in that mess anymore. When we give ourselves to him, then we can be able to understand ourselves and we can be able to understand what it was that we were put on this earth for. When you begin to live into that, it changes everything. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God now and forever. So if you know that your heart has never been made pure by coming to the Lord in repentance, by crying out to him for his forgiveness, by saying, I give up trying to be the Lord of my life and I want you to be the Lord of my life. If you know that you've never done that, it's not too late. Today would be a great day. If you've been resisting God's purification in some area of your life, if, if you keep making that same mistake over and over again and it's not changing and you're wondering why, the reason is because there's purification that God wants to do. But for some reason, we're holding on and not letting the ugly go. There's great news. It's not too late for that either. Today would be a great day. He's ready to do amazing things in us and through us if we'll let him open our eyes and our hearts to him and what he's doing. If we'll ask him, he'll remove those impurities. He'll make us shine like the purest gold. He'll build us into something amazingly beautiful and useful. He's promised. Proverbs 3 and Ezekiel 36 contain two great promises. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Doesn't mean he'll make it easy, but he'll get you on track. He'll set you in the direction that he intends. In Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. It's all God's work. All we have to do is ask. Just like King David when he made a huge mess of his life and other people's around him. And he just said, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. If we'll pray that, he will do it. Can we pray that? Lord Jesus, we trust you. We confess that we are sinful, we are broken, we are impure and imperfect. And yet, we also confess that we believe you loved us, that you died for us on the cross, that you rose again on the third day and live forevermore so that you can do your purification work in us and through us in this world. We submit ourselves to your lordship right now. We ask you, Lord, to come in, to remove the junk, to purify our hearts so that we can see you everywhere we look and we can be assured that we will see you forever, for all eternity when we leave this world. We pray and trust in you, Jesus. Amen.